Hello, welcome to the Business Lounge. Now, if I mentioned names to you like Harry Hill, Frank Skinner, Carolina Hearn, uh, Ross Noble, Michael McIntyre, Johnny Vegas, most of you will probably know most of those names, but do you know the man who is behind them, or certainly was? He's my guest now, John Marshall, otherwise known as Agraman, the human anagram, which I'm sure we'll come on to in a moment or two. It's very good to see you. And I'm right, aren't you? I mean, I'm right, aren't I, that, that these people have uh, launched their careers with your oh, help. Absolutely, yeah. I've um, had various people over the years have actually thanked me for it. So I've had, I'm, I'm starting to appear in autobiographies these yeah. days. So if you read Peter Kay's books, um, Dave Spikey's book, Alan Carr's book, um, I mean Stuart Lee's book, um, I'm bound to be in Jason Manford's book because he actually did start for me one day when he was working behind the bar at the, at the pub I was doing really? my comedy club in. Yeah, uh, let's go. Let's go yeah. right back to the beginning. Yeah. I mean, we'll we'll come on to talk about some of the yeah, names. Yeah. I'm sure a bit later on. But <laughs> you are a comedian, in theory, although you say yes. yourself you're not very funny. No, I'm only, I mean it's all pun based. So there's only so many puns you can take, and the difference in my particular style is that I actually take a whole load of puns on one subject and bang them all together into a, a long story. Yeah. So I've made a, a pun on the place names of, of, of all the little suburbs of Hull, for example, yeah. you know, which, which then makes a cohesive story. But really it's just an excuse to put lots of puns together. And how did it all start for you? I mean, when did you realise that you had a, a talent for making people laugh? I think at school, really. I mean, initially I, I was the form idiot because I wasn't very well at school and I was suffering from brain information. So to try and cover the fact that I wasn't very well. I, I started acting, acting funny and, and, and people were laughing and people didn't realise I wasn't well. But I managed to actually <laughs> fool them for a couple of years yeah. before I got too, too ill and uh, had to finally give up the ghost on it. But I always used to love, uh, when I was at school, I just certain poets and certain people, I just liked uh, uh, playing with words really. I have always, always did do and uh, people like Dylan Thomas inspired me. and. Uh, Roger McGough and all sorts of people. So, so when you left school, did you mm. continue in that vein or did you go off and do... When I left school things? I was unemployable unfortunately. I was too ill. I didn't get any qualifications. I left school with no qualifications and then I was unemployable because I had a lot of scar tissue on my brain from the encephalitis I had. Mm. Um, and then I thought, well I'm not going to be able to go to uni now. I just had enough of being... I just couldn't, couldn't face going back to study again. I thought, what would I really like to do? And I thought, well, play records all day. So I went to work in a record shop. I had a good knowledge of music. So, yeah. and then they offered me the, and then I then I managed the record shop, and then they wanted me to be a director and etc. etc. But it would have meant I would would have had to come off the shop floor. I wouldn't be able to play records, so I turned that down. <laughs> Was it also something about interacting with people as well? Yes. That you like, because I mean, yeah. clearly that's going to have to be some form of yeah of yeah. importance for, but, for uh, someone like but, that. But but it, it it was a bit. Being in the record shop was a bit like being a DJ. You'd play this track to people say, hey, listen to this track, it's great, fantastic. It was like a sharing thing. So it was a bit the same with when I did comedy later on. It was like a, making people laugh or making people, or even just being involved in, in a show. And people knew it was me that, was a, that had put the show together. And people say, oh, great night, mate. Fantastic. Yeah. You know. So it's rewarding. It's better than selling insurance, really. Can you remember your first, uh, first gig on stage? Um, not, not exactly. I mean, I, it would have been one of the folk clubs I went to, but I... I to try and fit in with, with, because folk clubs were the only place you could do comedy, um, I tried to do something that might not offend people who went to folk clubs. So I did um, rhyming, I did sort of poem, comedy poetry. So I started off along that line just so I'd fit into the folk club format. Mm. Um, but then once I was free from that, I just used to just write my own jokes. And, and the style was I'd just, instead of chatting to the audience and saying, what do you do, where do you come from? I'd just bombard them with bad puns and then eventually I'd say, now do you want an act? And everybody go, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. And that sort of became a trademark, you know, do you want an act? And it was like a threat that I would do another pun. And we're talking, what, early 70s here when you were doing this? No, we're talking about, first started out around 86. So I was quite right. late in starting. Yeah. And yeah. what was the comedy circuit like that? I mean, now we know, I mean, the name Well, there wasn't really, I mean, apart huge. from London, there was a couple of comedy clubs in London, obviously the Comedy Store had been the first one. There was nothing. So when I first started, you know, my, my first comedy club, people would, you know, you'd go to the newspaper and say, would you list my comedy club? And they said, well, we haven't got comedy listeners. Where should we put it? Do we put it in theatre or do we put it in gigs? You know, there wasn't a comedy mm. section, though. So and this I, is Manchester area, Yeah, it? this was this was pioneering time. So. You know, I, I got the first regular comedy club going in Manchester, and then 
everybody else followed from there, really. How did you, how, tell me about how that comedy club came about. Well, uh, basically, as I say, the, uh, I wanted to be a comedian, so I went along. The only place you could possibly have a go was, was a folk club, so I went along to a couple of folk clubs that had been listed in, in a magazine called City Life in Manchester, and they, they weren't running anymore, so I, I thought, well, that's that silly, the listings aren't up to date. So I rang up City Life, complained, and they said, well, would you write the comedy section? So, so eventually I did. did. Then I did the jazz restaurant reviews, gig reviews, ended up being a semi-journalist, if you like, and uh, then started my own. I th actually found there were people on the folk circuit that uh, were actually quite good. You know, I didn't particularly like the traditional stuff so much, but some really good talent out there. So I thought, I'll open my own folk club, make it a modern folk club, and I'll compare it. So there's a comedy content. And how did you go about that? I mean, what did you do? Find an old building or take take? A uh, just a room, room above a pub. <coughs> Um, right. You know, just renting a room. Yeah. Very successful. It went very, very well. And I started to bring in comedians that we had at the folk club. I, I had them, Henry Normal, Hattie Hayridge, Linda Smith, Sean Hughes, Frank Skinner, people just starting out at that time. Um, so it was very successful. And then eventually I wanted to do a bigger, bigger show. So I went to a, I found a much bigger room, massive room actually, a place called Charlton place called the Southern Hotel and it was a superb room. You could seat 250 cabaret staff, so wow. that's how big it was. Yeah. So, so That must have been so quite nerve-wracking for you. I mean, aside from yeah. thinking about how you're going to make people laugh, you've got to think about how you get people in. But initially, as I say, it, again, it wasn't opened as a comedy club and I still wasn't exactly self-employed, it was just an interest really. But it, it became so successful and it soon became apparent that the people, the people who like music and people who like comedy were two different audiences. So I did around two nights. Wednesday was music, Thursday was comedy. But when I first started doing music and comedy together, we had some bizarre mixtures of people. So we had a, a local band called the Raging Cajuns. Everybody locally had a big following. Then we had a, a poor fellow called Harry Hill who had to come on. Actually he was called Harry Hall in those days. Oh really? He, 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 before he became, he, when he went to register Harry Hall it had already gone so he, he changed to Harry Hill. But he was still a GP at that stage. And uh, he, said, he said to me, when I invited him to his, my recent wedding, he said, uh, he said, I still have nightmares of that night with Raging Cajuns, he said, <laughs> <laughs> having to go in between the band when everybody was impatient for the band to come back. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but then, of course, it, it just took off big style and we, we really filled the place for 15 whole years. What Every, was it about it that made it popular? I, I think, first of all, we were lucky enough to have the, the great acts. The room was just perfect. No, no, no pillars in the way. The site, the, the stage was the right height. The whole thing was very. Everybody was packed in very small furniture, um, bar right at the very back, and just the atmosphere was fantastic. It absolutely, mm. and it, of course, it was voted the best comedy club on many occasions by by various newspapers and also by the comedians themselves as their their favourite club to actually play. Well, this is the thing, isn't it? I suppose mm. once you get you have a, an environment, a club that is well known. It's not going to be that tricky to get the acts, the good acts, to come along. But how did yeah. you get it started? How did you manage to get the likes of someone who would become Harry Hill and, and Peter Kay? And Peter? I think a very adventurous booking <coughs> policy. I'd always, um, I'd always try new people every single, every single show. As long as I got a couple of people I knew were good, and I was there were a few comedy agencies just starting out then, around about 1990. You got Off the Curb and Avalon and people who are big names now. Um, they were all starting out and so they would always send me one of their acts and I'd, I'd built up a local scene. I'd got, I'd, luckily I'd got Steve Coogan, John mm. Thompson, Dave Gorman, Henry Noble, Caroline Ahern, all in 1990. And, and they all kept, now and household they, names. Yeah, and they kept, on, they kept on coming and of course gave Peter Kay's first ever gig. I thought, wow, you know, how good is this guy? He was a natural. Yeah. Lee Evans, another one. He rang me up. You know, I'm Lee Evans, could you give me a gig? I have never heard of you before, but we'll, we'll give you a gig. Yeah, and uh, that, was, that was the attitude I had, really. But does that, uh, you then, I guess, became more of a, a, a booker and a promoter yes. than you did a comedian. And did yeah, you... but I still compared the shows. Yeah. But I kept my stuff brief. And, and the, the other thing, of course, is I've got heaps and heaps of material. I've got, you know, hundreds of stories about them. I mean, I've got one about dogs, for example, right. with all the names of dogs in it. But, you know... <laughs> But it became, you know, because I had such an unusual style, they said, oh, it's Agriman, you know, it's a, he's a weird guy. Yeah, how did that name come about? Agriman the Human Anagram? Well, yeah, it was, <laughs> it was because I think, I think in the, in the mid-80s, there was a lot of um, political 
commonly around. There were a lot of people protest poetry and stuff like that. There was one or two sort of till of a stockbroker and all these people. And it was a bit like aggro, man. It was a bit, there was a bit of the aggro, so it had a bit of a cutting edge to it. And then the denouement was it, aggro, man. Is he, no, the human anagram, you know, anagram, the word anagram. Mm. But, uh, I thought of various other much better names since, but it stuck, of course. And then people just knew me as aggro, man. So although I probably, I think, oh God, not that name again, but it, I've, it stuck with it. Also. Absolutely right. <laughs> you, uh, uh, how long did that club last? Because I mean, it went for a good few years, didn't it? Fifteen whole <laughs> years, every single Thursday, right throughout the year. So. Uh, and what yeah. was the reason for it for you for you closing it down? Well, first of all, I'd already moved to the Hull area, so I was having to go back mm. to compare it. And secondly, the land the the landlord and landlady that had been uh, helping me out re in, in latter years, they were leaving, and there was somebody else coming in who said he didn't want to do the comedy club, which was suicide, really. Mm. In fact, he, he was only in the pub a few months and ruined it and, and was out again. Was but, out, yeah. but, you know, w when you're relying on renting a room, then that's very, very important. So that was, mm. but I think I'd had enough doing 15 whole years doing any job, you know. But you've met some incredible people. Well, yeah, I mean, it's just, just amazing. One, I would say, ninety percent of any every comedian on t every person that appears on television has, has played at the Buzz. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? And you, you know, we talk to a lot of people uh, on the business uh, who are involved in business and industry, and I suppose it's very easy to forget that the leisure industry and the entertainment industry is just that. It is a business. It, oh, in it's itself. a massive. It's an industry. It's a massive business. And and the problem, the problem, my problem has been really that I suppose. I'm too interested in the comedy and not, in, and not enough in business. I know we're doing a business interview now, but basically one of the reasons I'm not successful is because I don't particularly want to be. I like to do what I, I like doing and I like to be at comedy shows. I mean, I could have been a manager or an agent for Peter Kay or Steve Coogan or somebody and made a lot of money, but that's not my main aim. I, I just really do enjoy comedy. Were you given the, the opportunity to do that? Well, I, I could have, you I could could have, have done easily got myself there. into those sort of positions because I you know, from taking Peter Cable from discovering him, I, I was the first person to pay him. I was the first person to give him a one-man show, and it wasn't successful the first one because everybody said, "Well, we've never heard of him, mate." Mm. You know, who's mm. Peter Kay? Mm. For his time, he was very alternative, wasn't he? Yeah. So when 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 I did a one-man show with him, we, you know, we did okay. We we had a, I managed to get people say, you know, enough people. I said, "Look, take my word, come and see him," and then the word got round. We put him on again a couple of months later, sold out, and then. Had another one sold out, and then after that, he was off and away. You know, the the world had heard of Peter Kay, and, uh, and that was it. And now he's become Geraldine. But it's the same mm. with all these, uh, with all the comedians. I mean, Alan, when you think that our house comedians were people like Alan Carr, John Bishop, they'd come and try the new material out, living very close by. I mean, it was just unbelievable. You look back at it now, and yes, <laughs> I right know. Do you think it's a missed opportunity that, that you know you, that you didn't become a a promoter or an agent for someone? Um, do you regret it, it? No, no I don't actually. It's what I wanted to do. I'm still quite happy doing what I wanted to do. As it happens, I've come across I've come across to Hull and I'm now with a lady who's luckily got plenty of money, so... <laughs> <laughs> so Here's a man with the right idea. <laughs> you know. Um, and are you still in touch with somebody? I mean, you mentioned Harry Hill. Um, who I think you said you saw recently. You yeah, were. I mean, people, they, they quite often, you know, Peter's obviously, Peter Kay is in touch every so often and said, is it all right if I use this clip from years ago when you said this about me or, you know, or can mm. I use you for this? And mm. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, I'm not, they, all famous people tend to surround themselves with agents and et cetera, and it, it's difficult to make, personal contact with him, but, but yeah, if I want to, I was, yeah, talking to John Bishop the other day or whatever, yeah, you, but not on an everyday basis, but mm. I'm still, I'm still working with people now who will be, some of them will be the next big name. So. Well, this is what I wanted to go on to, is mm. Buzz Comedy mm. and the whole thing that you're, yeah, you're about yeah. now, and tell me, I mean, tell me what the idea is. Well, the idea, I suppose, is really, I'm, I'm somebody who, I, I'm a, basically, I'm a, a talent spotter in a way, I like to think I can spot people who are, are going to be big, and my, I make my living these days by programming comedy clubs. People come to me and say, could be arts centres, could be councils, could be comedy clubs, could be corporate occasions. And they come to me and say, you know, we want, we'd like a comedian or we'd like a whole night of comedy. 
you know, and have you got some comedians? So if I if I might be set, be given a budget, somebody might say I've got six hundred six hundred quid or something. So I've got to make my money out of that budget. Yeah. So if I can get somebody who's good value for money, somebody who's really funny, but I'm only paying them fifty quid, then I'm going to make myself more money. So I'm working along those lines all the time, finding people who are very good already, and it's only a matter of time before they're big, and they're still still doing that. So, and it seems that the appetite for comedy has returned, and it? because oh, it, yeah. it, it went for a long time, mm. and, and the likes of Harry mm. Hill and the names we've all we've just already mentioned yeah. have brought it well and truly back into the fold. Yeah, I, I don't know why that was. There was this uh, perception on television that, you know, people doing their own comedy acts wouldn't mm. make good telly, and of course nowadays it's. That there's lots of shows, but for years and years it was dominated by sitcoms, and, and I never really understood it because it was like the demise of Saturday there. Night at the Palladium, wasn't yeah. it? I mean, we, we'd lost our appetite as a yeah. society for that sort of variety See, of shows. Yes, I don't know why we had, but because I've, I was always, I was, I knew how good the comedy. Was. People said, "Oh, comedy is no good these days." I said, "Well, it's, it's what you see on TV isn't, isn't what's happening on, in the clubs out there, you know," mm. and it is still happening. But now, people are coming on, and people are realizing actually. It's never gone away. It's always been there. Mm. So ever since the mid '80s, as far as I'm concerned, it's never gone away. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So what? The, what's the future for, for Buzz Comedy then? I mean, well, just I just bumble along like I normally <laughs> do, really. Um, it, I've not got a, a world domination aim, or it's not a. It is a business, but it, it just ticks along. And uh, but you're still seeing new acts coming. Yeah, through. I mean, I'm, I'm quite happy to take on new work, and you know, if somebody, you know, wants to put on a comedy show, then mm. I will always pick the best acts for their, for them. I won't. I don't have a particular act on my books and and say, well, you, he's the actor who'll come to you. I'm not an agent as such. I just choose which acts are the best. So, mm. if it's a working men's club or if it's a conservative club, liberal labour club, I'll I'll choose the acts differently. If it's a student union again or arts centre, you know, I'll I'll try and get this sort of acts that mm. I think will go down well in those. You have to situations. choose it quite well, I suppose. Yeah, that, to know the audience. That's that's basically what hopefully what my skill is. Mm. Is, is, is recognising the sort of comedian. And I like to put a balanced bill together. I'd like to have, a, rather than three white male stand-ups, I'd like to have a sort of novelty act or a magician or a musical act or just something a bit different. Not, you know, a lot of these jongleurs, comedy clubs, and even the comedy story itself, it tends to be sort of lots of white middle-class comedians one after another and, you know, just cr crowd control a lot of it. And, and yeah. uh, I've always liked to do something a bit more original, you know, so. Well. Mm. Continued success mm. with that. It's great yeah. to have you with us, John. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Blair. John Marshall. Mm.